we find a lot of times that loss or turnover comes where somebody's in a role where they're working against their natural instincts. Sometimes people label that stress or burnout and all that kind of thing, when really it's they're not able to be in their zone. Welcome back, everyone, to the Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization Show, the home of Googleization Nation, where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about the crazy shift going on all around us and explore the disruptive convergence of technology, business, and people. Here are your hosts, Ira Wolf and Jason Cochran. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Geek Skeezers and Googleization, a show from the People Forward Network and winner of the Most Forward Thinking People Forward Impact Award. I'm Ira Wolf, and thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. And I'm Jason Cochran. If you think this is just another podcast, think again. We're the voice of the most important crucial conversations that are confronting business leaders and people today. Our goal is to bring you ways to reimagine tomorrow and explore the impact and convergence of business, technology, and people. And I, uh, today, this episode of Geek Skeezers and Googleization is sponsored by our partners at Hawaii Institute, your personal and professional GPS for a meaningful life and purpose-filled career. You'll hear more about the Hawaii Institute and Hawaii Operating System later in the show. Well, Ira, today, we're going to be talking about our minds with Sean Goyes, and it's going to be fascinating. Our minds are a beautiful thing, um, and they're also quite mysterious. There's still so much we don't understand about how our minds work, and just like snowflakes, no two minds are alike. And when you step back and you really think about that, it really makes it truly remarkable that human beings are able to be productive and work together effectively at all. In business, when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we rarely consider those terms within the context of neurodiversity, which is the natural way that people think, learn, perceive the world, interact and process information differently. And it can include folks who uh, often identify as being on the autism spectrum um, or having dyslexia or ADHD, to name a few. And instead, when we often refer to DEI, it's within the context of a person's uh, skin color or their ethnicity, or their sexual orientation. But we have numerous examples in nature of just how essential diversity is. Biodiversity creates habitats and ecosystems that flourish together with the right blend of organisms. So why is it that inside the metaphorical walls of our organizations that we still have leaders who want and expect folks to mostly think and act the same, and leaders who also want to hire people based on culture fit instead of culture ad. Reframing our own mindsets on these differences and how everyone thinks, processes information, learns and works together can help us recapture them as strengths instead. In today's episode on unlocking the power of the human mind with coach and consultant Sean Goyas of HumanWorks 8, he's gonna help us do just that on today's episode. But now it's time for our weekly Perfect Labor Storm segment. On each episode, we focus on just one disruptive, surprising, or worrisome trend that we believe you should know. And here's today's perfect labor storm. Despite the fact that upwards of 20% of the U.S. population are diverse, half of people managers and leaders say they wouldn't hire a neurodiverse employee. Unfortunately, there's a lot of lingering misconceptions about neurodivergent people in the workplace, and employers worry that they'll require too much support, won't be a good culture fit, and won't have the necessary skill sets to do the job. But in large part, research and public initiatives are debunking these myths. For example, a national report from Drexel University says that 51% of workers on the spectrum have higher skills than what they need to do the job. JP Morgan and Chase's Autism at Work program found employees with autism are 48% faster and up to 92% more productive than their peers, with common factors including strong visual acuity, attention to detail, which, was, which is always one of the most in-demand skills, and a superior ability to focus. Before we jump in and, and start talking with Sean and exploring neurodiversity and the exciting human mind, I want to remind everybody that by listening to Geek Skeezers and Googleization, 
you can obtain SHRM credits. You can get between one half to one credit for each episode that you listen to. It's very easy uh, to do that. Uh, listen to the episode, go up to googleizationnation.com, click on podcast right under podcast. Uh, you'll see the f a short form that you need to complete, just a couple highlights that you learned so we can verify that you listened, and we will send you the activity code. Uh, while you're there, if you're not al already a member of Googleization Nation, uh, please take a few minutes and join. We got a lot of exciting things coming up in the beginning of the year, which we'll be announcing shortly, uh, including some live events, uh, some top rated speakers, some really A plus uh, guests that we're going to have. And we're looking forward to a great 2023. And if you'll take a few minutes and uh, rate the show, whether you're listening on Apple or Spotify, we'd really appreciate it. But now seems like a pretty good time to welcome today's guest, Sean Gullius. So let's please give him a really big, warm Googleization Nation welcome to Sean. Hi, Sean. Welcome to the show. Good afternoon, everybody. Jason, Ira, thank you for that introduction. Yeah. Right, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling the love. There you go. Absolutely. Well, and we're in the mood to unpack some mysteries of the mind today, and we're glad that you're here to be our guide on that. And so uh, why don't we start here, Sean? Tell us a little bit about your journey of the work that you do and how you became interested in this side of the workplace and understanding how people think and how to get them to work cohesively as a team. Fantastic. Well, you know, I think it goes way back, Jason, Ira. Um, my background is in the theater world. My undergraduate work and my graduate work was all in live theater. And I believe then trying to work with actors to understand how characters work and what motivates them and how they're different from how they are wired, um, sort of started that thinking around that. It's trying to help people guide actors to understand different characters and different ways people work. But then in my 25 years in human resources, of course, that got ratcheted up. Hey, how do we really get to know people well and really get them in the right roles and the right jobs doing the right things? And I don't know about both of you, but I was kind of jaded with a lot of assessments that do that, that either focus on cognitive ability or affectability, personality, until about 15 years ago, where I was introduced to the Colby Corporation and Kathy Colby, the theorist around uh, the cognitive part of our brains. And I took my Colby, the Colby A index, and uh, the result changed my life, Jason, and how I look at what I do, how I look at people. And I think um, my jadedness around assessments really sort of got reset that way as I continued learning over the last 15 years from Kathy, from the great people at the Colby Corp in Phoenix, um, around the three parts of the mind and how this cognitive nature and our natural instincts is a, is a thing we all have to understand better and use better both in life and at work. And before we get into those three parts, Sean, of the <laughs> yeah. mind that you just referenced, would you be willing to share with us what is your result? What did you get from the Colby? Right, well, the Colby measures um, your innate action in four modes, fact finder, follow through, quick start, and implementer. And my results are five in fact finder, a four in follow through, an eight in quick start, and a two in implementer. So it's on a range. There's a range in each of those modes from a one result to a 10 result. And the one thing around as you get your results and around this assessment, um, sometimes as human beings, we're wired saying, well, if I got a two in something, that must not be good. And if I got an eight in something, that must be where I'm strong. Incorrect thinking around your Colby and around this cognitive part of the brain, because a one result is just as strong as a 10. It's just strong in a different way. That's interesting. And so you, you've now mentioned cognitive and you've mentioned these three parts of the brain. Let's get into some of the, the brain science behind some of that work that you do. Walk us through what are those those three different parts of the brain, and you mentioned cognitive, so let's really dig into that one yeah. um, to help us understand how these types of results better understand ourselves and how we function within a team. Fantastic, Jason. Well, I think everybody is probably familiar with the cognitive part of our minds. Um, some people you call it that, our IQ, how smart we are, intelligence that way. And I think as human beings, we look at people through that cognitive lens a lot, and it's a really important part of who we are 
our cognitive ability. So that's the first part of the mind. The second is that affective part of our, our minds. And that is our personality. Sometimes people would say, that's your EQ and your likes, your dislikes, your values, beliefs that way. And again, I think there's a lot of good assessments and things that measure and give you information about, around that part of our minds. But that third part and what you sort of brought up that I've already mentioned a bunch of times, I cannot not talk about it. It's one of those things, a passion of mine, is the third part is the conative part of our minds. And that is our natural drive and instinct. If I have the freedom to do it my way, what is Sean's way of naturally taking action that I've been doing since I was 4, 40, I'll do it at 80, I'll do it at 120 that way. So it's that conative drive. Gotcha. So the conative is kind of like our our natural way of processing and how we like to handle things. Is that right? It's your natural way of doing, taking action, thinking of the doing mode. If there's thinking, if there's feeling, then there's doing in our minds. Of course, our minds are all working together at the same time, but it's the actual doing, that action mode. I think you know that I've got uh, about 28 years in in the business of assessments. I built a whole business around assessments. I know. I'm with Kobe. Um, <laughs> So one of, I guess one of the questions I have, and, and this is true of many of the assessments that we use, we're trying to figure out how people will go to work. And, and we, we looked at it in three different ways, how people think about decisions, how they approach decision-making, solving problems. And certainly Colby seems to fit really well into that category. And then we talk about how people actually go about the work. You know, are they tentative to detail? Are they organized? Do they work at a fast pace? Uh, and then we also look at how people relate to one another. You know, big classification would be extroversion, but then we also talk about self-restraint, self-control, and, and interactions that way. Many of the assessments, and, and again, and I'll take some of the categories that you talk about, is fact finder, follow through, quick start, implementer. Because I have the instinct to do that doesn't necessarily mean I have the skill to do that. Am I correct? Because you're much more knowledgeable about, about Colby than I am, but that's a mistake. And going back to some of the, even the, one of the basics is DISC. Most people are familiar with DISC or Myers-Briggs. And we talk about, you know, if you're an I, people would say, well, they're really good with people. Or if you're, you're an extrovert, you must be really good with people, which isn't the case. Just because you're energized by working with people or influencing people doesn't necessarily mean you're good at it. So if I'm if if on Colby, if my thinking process is quick start, which was mine, um, how it doesn't necessarily mean I'm successful at it. That's a great question, Ira. And here's what one thing to think about. And as we talk about think, 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 that's all cognitive thinking and, and sort of that IQ kind of um, reasoning behind things. Um, I think you are good at your quick start, Ira, if that's your result. You know, I think you are good. And if you naturally dive in and take action your way around that improvisation, innovating, and that's a part of who you are with that higher quick start result, um, you can do that naturally, Ira. Now, you're talking about your cognitive knowledge, capabilities, learning. Now, if it's around a topic where you don't have that cognitive ability, there might need to be some cognitive learning because your brain is, of course, all working at the same time. But I would say your natural way of innovating or taking action through that quick start mode, you're good at that, Ira, no matter what. So that, that's the foundation there. And that's what you should lean into to take action first is, is what Colby and what I would recommend when I'm coaching people that have that kind of result. And I know you're familiar with the why, the discover your why. So how do these two relate? Because they sound pretty similar in as far as what, what's my drive. So if I'm a quick starter and I'm a challenge, which, I, which is me, again, I've got 50 years of experience under my belt for good or bad, um, but there's other, you know, if I'm 22 years old coming out of school, I'm teaching a master's class, Jason was a guest lecturer, and people were in there saying, listen, I'm still trying to find my way. What, what type of path should I, should I share? How should I promote myself on my resume? What am I going to be good at? Uh, how, do you, how do you relate those two, and how does the, this big picture start to come together? 
Yeah, I re- you know I'm familiar. I'm definitely familiar with Y, and the Y the Y group loves Colby. I just interacted with a bunch of the, the people from that organization in Phoenix in October. Now, the Y is a personality assessment. It's an effective assessment, and I believe my Y and my what what I my value and sort of my purpose drives can change over time, Ira. So that change that could change. So the what I'm sort of uh, want. And what I sort of believe at a younger age could change over time. But what doesn't change over time is the way I would take action on that. Hmm. And that is what Colby measures. So there, there is a, they work, you can, again, one thing about assessments, when we work with a lot of our clients, they may be using a cognitive or an effective assessment. And we say, that's great. I mean, don't want to just focus on one part of the brain because that's all working together at all times. We're just saying, what is the thing that does not change? It's a research shows that the way you're wired at a young age, you will be the rest of your life. And how do you really understand that well, leverage it and lean into it? Now, we're in the life cycle of an employee. So, uh, you know, the first thing that happens is we were we did a lot of pre-employment testing. So people would call up and, and want a pre-employment test. And there's some that just aren't good pre-hire. I mean, they basically prevent people from getting a job that they may be skilled at, they may be experienced at. And, you know, maybe a a two or a three on quick start or follow through may be good enough to do that job well uh, enough. I mean, that's, that would be my assumption, but where does this fit? I mean, can you use this from a pre-employment aspect to find if somebody's qualified to do the job or is it more of a development tool? I mean, and it could be used both ways, but let's start with talent and hiring since we work with that way with a lot of our clients. Um, I believe I wouldn't hire somebody into my organization unless I knew what their Colby and their innate re- instincts were, because that is how important it is for me. Knowing that I can see if there's a match where 80% of the time in a role that they're going to be working along with their natural instincts and not working against the grain. And so Colby has a lot of good research product reporting where you can come up with a range of success, Ira, for a replicated role. So we can get high performers. What do their Colby A's look like in the role? And then there's a thing called the Colby C, what that a leader takes, how a leader envisions a role or what the leader believes the role does. And you can come up with a really strong range of success that can give you confidence in making that decision around role fit conatively. You still want to interview for cognitive ability. You still want to interview for personality. Of course, you'd never want to look at one only that way. But that greater confidence around what the job is going to entail and what I'm going to be actively doing on the job, that is the, that's the missing link a lot of times with hiring. And what we're finding when those in that area, or whether it's a recruiting team, HR team, leadership team, looking and saying, hey, okay, we've hired a lot of people. We've lost them. We find a lot of times that loss or turnover comes where somebody's in a role where they're working against their natural instincts. Sometimes people label that stress or burnout and all that kind of thing, when really it's they're not able to be in their zone where sort of they're free to do it their way that matches up with what that role needs for creative problem solving, for doing whatever that outcome is necessary for the business. So, Sean, as you were describing that, that makes me think there's product market fit, right? Whenever businesses are going to market with a new product or service, they're trying to figure things out. The way you're describing things is this is really about where the Colby and the conative uh, parts of the brain, understanding that really helps with people role fit in the organization. And so that's also got me wondering this whole uh, dichotomy we often hear about nature versus nurture. Um, And so a question for you would be, Are there ever times where, yes, maybe someone's conative part comes up as indicating something, the role might require something different. Is it a, is it a, not a good practice or a bad practice to take that person and come up with a development plan to help them grow into that role if it's not a natural fit? Because I think a lot of organizations still come at it that way of thinking, I think I've found the right person and I can help develop them or grow them into other aspects of the role. Is that something you often try to steer folks away from if it doesn't look like it's a conative fit? 
Well, um, I, I love that question, Jason. And of course, when you're looking at talent these days, do you always have the perfect candidate is sort of what you're saying. And is there a, a you know, is there a right fit that way? I would say a couple of things. Knowing somebody's Colby and if there is that clash or that strain in what the job is requiring and what the, the way the person is taking action. Uh, now, the Colby doesn't say you can't do anything. We're human beings. We can do anything we darn well want to do. So the Colby doesn't say you can't do anything. It just tells you if you're able to do it your way, how you would. So anybody can work again. I bet that there are lots of people out there in roles where they're constantly working against the grain. But that is a depletion of energy. It's, it, it, like I said, usually labeled stress or burnout. I would say it's more strain, mental strain in the brain as far as what's going on that way. And Colby does offer really strong, conable tips. So when you have something that way, if you find out what that strain is or where those um, mismatches might be. So let's say, for example, in that fact finder mode, maybe I'm in a role where I have to do research nine to five. That is, that is what the role requires. Um, myself, that would not be a great fit for, the major for me working nine to five. But let's say I'm in the role, okay? Hey, work is not perfect at all times. Knowing my Colby and knowing the way I work, I know that I can do that research, but I need to break it up in smaller chunks, Jason. Do you see what I'm saying? So there's coaching ways to do that where I don't deplete my energy and that fits the way I'm wired instinctively so I can do a researching role. Now, maybe that role says, sorry, Sean, I know that's the way you work, but this role requires nine to five. You don't get to break it up. You just have to be in it. Then I would say, Hey, maybe it is time to mentor. We often say, hey, is there another role within the organization? You don't want to lose the talent that's a better fit to the way that person's going to work. Does gotcha. that so a little bit? It does. So if, I, so if I were to summarize and hear what you just shared there, Sean, it sounds like we don't necessarily not hire someone because it's not nat naturally a good fit for certain aspects of the role. But if we understand the conative part of the mind, that might mean there have to be specific scaffolds or supports uh, early on for that person to help them do that task or role in a conative way that aligns with the flow of you their conative it. mind. You gotcha. got it. And depending on what the role is, oftentimes we work with teams and maybe there's somebody else on the team that can take parts of that that naturally aligns that way. Do you know what I'm saying? Depending if it's an individual contributor or if it's more of a team approach understanding, of course, the teams, and that really makes the team very high, much more high performing when everybody's working in their natural mode of action. And sometimes we say, hey, what can, I always say, hey, what can I delegate to somebody else that's not my strength that needs to get done that can really lean into where they excel? That's really good. And of course, you heard us talk at the top. One of the, the topics we wanted to get into with you today is this topic of diversity. Um, because we often think about it in terms of the color of someone's skin, sexual sure. orientation, ethnicity, and things. But there's this whole other aspect of just neurodiversity and that every single person's mind, their instincts are unique to them, like a snowflake or a thumbprint. <laughs> and so can you walk us through, how do you help businesses think through that at a team level of once people understand the conative aspects of their mind, what does that look like in terms of helping them work cohesively as a team? Well, everything I'm talking about, of course, is Kathy Colby's theory and her work over the last 45, almost going on 50 years in, around conation. And one thing she's proven is equality in human beings around their conative nature. And that, I mean, that's just, that's something that over my use of it, just saying, hey, that's what it's about. If we can get organizations thinking about, hey, we're all equal here and we're unique, but the energy in our brains, in this part of our brains, is equal. And knowing that on a team, that really allows a team to really look at their players in a whole different way and allows them to know, okay, right now we may be built this way, where we have a lot of energy and the way people take action this way. But to really get synergy and the strongest synergy on the team is that you want to have a, across the 12 different areas of action across those four modes. Um, if we're missing something, for example, let's say we find a lot of times in teams that we work with with the clients, they have a lot of people that like specifics, research that detail, but they don't have a lot of simplifiers, Jason, people that really cut through and get to that bottom line. And teams that, have, that are missing that instinct, for one, if they know they're Colby's, 
they can still work and coach and say, okay, well, we may go too deep. We don't have a simplifier. We need a better deadline. So there's coachable tactics they can take. But in future hiring, and to really bring that diversity on the team and that synergy on the team, they could look for somebody that does that naturally. It's Sean, as you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking back, you know, how I got started. I mean, 40 years ago, I was introduced to the disk assessment and used that in, in my, I mean, my business and then made a business out of it. Uh, and, and very similar, you know, talking about different behavioral styles, how people approach it. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily say people are passionate about what they do or qualified to do what they do, uh, just as how they're going to approach it. So yeah. for all the disc listeners out there, uh, and then I know there's, we, we got an audience that has quite a few people, um, you know, we're, we're talking about tools that complement that. And that's basically how I built my business. Uh, and I love that you said in the beginning is that this is just one small part. This is one part of the brain of what we're passionate about and this part doesn't change, but how we go about doing it and why we go about doing it and how our personality factors such as extroversion or introversion uh, impact that. Um, and, and you know, again, if I'm, I can be a quick starter and, you know, I can I, I'm very likely, I mean, you can correct me, but I assume you can have a D, I, S or a C who's a quick starter, which means how they visually how how i can observe you doing the work as a quick starter may even be more diverse um because i'm going to see you go about doing it in in different ways am i correct um i believe so i you know you back to where you first started you say hey that passion well in our in our in our minds um looking at the three parts and you probably you know everything starts in our affect we have to have the the want the like we want to do something as human beings that's where that's where everything starts as far as that goes. So that that passion to want, that that purpose, um, really committing and getting into something that way, that, that's where everything starts. Now, here's the little twist there. Oftentimes, I would say, um, the next thing you should do is just jump in, go from your gut and your instinct and start at it. Don't bring in that, let that cognitive lag a little bit as far as that goes. Oftentimes as human beings, we start thinking about it too much and that stops all that good sort of creative problem solving that comes naturally through our instinct. So um, I just wanted to mention that. So you, cause you mentioned that thinking part, I believe, hey, everything in the way I've learned from Kathy and her, her research, everything that starts in that affect, it moves then to that, that instinct. And then you bring in that cognitive kind of filter that helps you get to those great outcomes. As, as my mind's just spinning with, with comments, and, and as soon as you said that, is just dive, you know, just do it. go with your emotion, go, go with your passion. And I, I'm just wondering if, I mean, from a quick start, it goes, yeah, that's what I love doing. From a fact finder, do they struggle? Do they struggle with doing that? No. No, I, you know, I don't believe it all. So, you know, what one of the rules Kathy taught me, um, Ira, is to act before you think. And it has changed my life as far as that goes. Especially Stop for thinking, somebody Sean, in just theater. Just do it. Right? Um, <laughs> yeah, well, you got it, you know. And, you know, and I, I think I was better at it in theater, Ira, than I was in the workplace, to be honest. Because in the workplace, you're taught all the stuff you're supposed to do. You know what I'm saying? As far as preparation, organization, and just like, oh my, it just, it works totally against my grain. I can do it well. I'm a human being. I can do, I can excel at anything that way. But acting before you think, um, you know, if I have a, a, if I have a desire, if I have a, a want that I want to do something, then I need to just dive in and do it my way. Now, from that quick start approach, that's going to be for me, brainstorming. It's going to be just writing. It's going to be just getting it all out there and not putting too much judgment out there. You said about a fact finder. Well, their way to act before they think is to jump into the details, jump into the research, whatever that is, they should just go there as far as don't, don't worry about, okay, maybe I don't have a process or I, you know, I'm not brainstorming. I'm just diving in. That's what they should do, Iris. So I believe any of the, wherever you lead with your instinct, if you have a, a sort of a initiating action that way, anybody can do it. It's not just those quick starts. Um, sometimes quick starts saying, oh, they're the only ones that can do it. No, anybody in follow through, dive in, create the process, design the process. Or if you're an implementer, build it, start forming it, start using your hands and making it tangible that way. So it can happen across any of the modes. So we're going to take a quick break. And this is just a fascinating conversation. But when we come back, Sean, I want to I want to talk. I want to go back into something you just said and talking about like fact finders. 
uh, can just jump into it and they'll deal with the facts. And the first thing I can hear from a manager or a leader is just get it done. <laughs> so are there are there in are there natural conflicts between some of these different styles? So if we're going to build a diverse team and have representatives from each of these four cognitive thinking styles, um, if if we have fact finders and we have quick starters and we have implementers, is there a natural conflict? So I'll give you some time to ruminate upon that and tie in everybody to make sure that they come back to get the answer. Uh, but you've been listening to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. We have a fascinating conversation with Sean Gullius from Human Works 8. We're talking about Colby, cognitive thinking, uh, neurodiversity, a whole lot of things. And we will be right back in two minutes. There's a certain kind of coach who believes what we believe, who leads people to greatness, who gets people unstuck, who unlocks all of your passion, a coach who helps people discover what drives them to tap into their superpowers. Then knowing your why is the first step to untap potential, to focus, to breakthroughs, a coach who's looking for a better way. Are you that coach? And welcome back, everyone, to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. Fascinating topic today. We're talking about how the human mind works. And if you want to get inside somebody's brain, um, kind of <laughs> open the engine and figure out what makes them tick. Um, stay tuned uh, and or go back and listen to the replay because it was fascinating on, on the beginning. So right before the break, Sean, I, I posed the question for you um, because I know a lot of times people will call and they're looking for an assessment uh, in the name of team building or getting culture fit. And it's really a more we've got a problem here. Somebody doesn't fit in. They're not getting work. You know, it's always team conflict or individual conflict. Um, and it seems that that like with any other tool uh, or with any, at any other model, that there's some built in natural conflicts, such as, you know, I, I presented, you know, fact finder and quick starter um, on the same team. Uh, do they potentially rub each other the wrong way? Because one wants to get the facts passionate about it, digs right in. As you said, they act with that thinking. They just dive in. And then the quick starter sort of jumps out of the plane without a parachute. Um, those seem to have a natural conflict. And is that true uh, uh, according to Colby model? Well, you know, we talk about cognitive conflict, definitely, Ira, as, as a topic that teams and individuals need to think about. But what, what that conflict can happen just within a mode. So let's say, for example, that I'm a high follow through, that I like process, I like to start something and finish something. I like to go one, two, three, four, five. And maybe I have a higher result in that action mode. And I'm working with somebody, though, that it's a one, two, or three at the opposite end of that sort of scale that way. There's cognitive conflict that way. 
in that relationship. There's going to be cognitive conflict. In the Colby model and the Colby thinking, that's a good thing um, because you don't want everybody working the same way. But if you don't understand the cognitive part of the brain, what as human beings do we do? Well, we blame cognitive. We're going to blame intelligence. There's something around intelligence that's a problem. If we don't know cognitive, we're going to blame personality. Okay, they're lazy. They're making shortcuts, whatever that may be. Once you understand this cognitive part of brains and you look at people that way and you value that difference and you value what they're, then you go, oh my gosh, yeah, I go one, two, three, four, five. Here, I want you to break it, break the process, come up with it because what's going to come out of that is going to be the strongest outcome by having those different ways of taking action on that. So yes, cognitive conflict is a good thing. We, we encourage organizations, relationships, teams to discover that. And when they do, wow, the ahas that go off. We were just working with a manufacturing company in Green Bay here, and there was some conflict on the team. Once they saw where that now, where that conflict is, I believe, actually housed, they're like, wow, that's it. It's almost like it's a relief. And then you start looking at that, that relationship quite different. And Colby, what the Colby Corporation does, a, their background and their reporting is so robust. There's actually reports where you can compare my result to your result, Ira, and it will talk about talking to me, Sean, if I'm working with Ira, here's what I need to think about. Here are the best ways. It's also a report talking to you, Ira. If you're working with Sean, it's not using the same report, but it's talking to you from the way you work really strong, actionable coaching that can really jumpstart relationships if they're new, or if you've been working for a long time and then get your A to A comparison, a lot of times it's kind of like, ha, yeah, God, we've been living this. This is truth. It brings out the truth in that relationship. And Sean, I've got to ask you this question. You mentioned earlier that there are certain things that, that can be fixated for people, certain things that may change over time in terms of personality disposition. When it comes to conation, can that change over time? And, and here's the, the context for that, that question. Myself, if you would have taken me back into high school and told me that I'd be an entrepreneur, I would have laughed in your face. Um, <laughs> the way I operate now, um, I thrive in chaos. I thrive in wearing multiple hats, shifting, going in multiple directions, figuring out the focus. I, I absolutely love that. In high school, it was very much just give me one thing please tell me what to do and how you want it done. And then the perfectionist side of me then was like, okay, I'm going to follow that list to the T and get it done to the best of my ability, the way that you want it. Now I'm very much more a, forget that. I think there's a better way to do it. And I'm going to go out to the market and test it a thousand different ways until we come up with the right way. It's what I just described. Does any of that have to do with conation and it potentially changing over time? Well, um, I, I don't believe it changes over time. Here's what I think a lot, a lot happens in schooling, Jason, when we're growing up. We're taught cognitively, cognitively to work a certain way. We are. And we're all taught pretty much to do it the same way. Um, the last thing in, in a lot of schooling is to say, hey, Sean, I want to give you the freedom to be yourself in fourth grade. Well, that doesn't, you know, that, sometimes it's like, a, let's line them up and we're all going to do a one, two, three, four, five. So I believe whatever you're doing now, or you, the, you I, I feel even when you talk about it, Jason, it's almost like you feel freer now than you did maybe then, just even the way you talked about it. I bet whatever that was, was there. I mean, if you would have taken your Colby or even the student aptitude test that can be done with a fourth grade reading level, I bet you were wired that way. Now, did your surroundings, did the way you were taught, all of that influence that? Of course it does. I mean, that all influences. But I believe the wiring was the same in the cognitive part of your brain, Jason. And the reliability testing um, that the Colby Corporation and they've done over the last 45 years, the, you won't find a higher reliability. Um, some of the modes are 90, 92%, some go 95 and higher. So there, there's a, the, the testing is really pure as far as how that goes. I've never seen greater that way around this part of the brain. Does that help? Yeah, it does. And and part of it too is uh, you were talking about the brain wiring. There's no doubt that my wiring has significantly changed <laughs> over the years because, oh, who, I'm sure. because who I was then in terms of how I thought about and approached the world was very much, like you said, framed by, you know, how my mom and dad thought, um, yes. you know, uh, you know, where you go to church, 
um, the group of friends that you have at that time, not wanting you to disappoint it. the teacher. Now I'm like, what teacher? Um, let's go out and let's see if we can maybe find a better way that might help the teacher grow in a different way. Yeah. So I think your your analysis there was spot on. I think you're talking your true nature there, Jason, right now in the, the little bit. Where you're I think so too. <laughs> Because I can tell it gives you more energy when you're talking. About, you, you got it. You know that. Sean, we're, we're coming up toward the end. It, these always goes amazingly fast. So we always like to close this segment with one question. And that question is, what question should we have asked that we didn't? Yeah. And here, here's what I think you should have asked. And that is... As I said at the beginning, sometimes I'm just jaded by all these assessments and use and and what is the value of using and thinking about conation and how can it really impact bottom line success of teams and organizations around people touch points? And I think that again is is what I'm just driven and passionate about because you can actually apply the conative theory and using this Colby not only for getting the right person in the right seat, but think about it for recognition. Think about it for um, your DEI and belonging. There's so many touch points that you can use this knowledge and validate and honor people in really true ways that I think organizations sometimes can't find those kind of connections around some other assessments that are out there. So that's what I think you should have asked me. You should have said, Sean, how can we really get it? How do we dig it in and apply it to actually business problems and challenges? We're really pleased that we asked that question because we got the answer. <laughs> That's right. And Sean, bef before we yeah. hop into the lightning round, so you teed that up perfectly. Explain to us your, your 12 touch points because you do this work. So just can you give us another minute or so of how that specifically looks of how you're taking Conation into these employee lifecycle touch points with clients to help the bottom line? Yeah, you know, we have our 12 people touch points um, and Colby has an application or a support or a value in each of them. So for example, I mentioned recognition, I mentioned DEI, another one is communication, another one is performance management. So there's 12 of them, um, whether it's orientation or onboarding, as I said, I would never onboard orient somebody. I want to know their Colby first. That is that that jump starts the relationship. That helps me that way. I think it's also a part of when you think about process and policy and how those are communicated. Different people take information different ways. How do you present that? Again, on the job, if somebody, you know, we're talking about outcomes, do I mind how somebody does the work as long as the outcome is successful? If you think about it that way, talk about the rewiring of leadership development and how you get leaders to think about people in new ways. So the 12 touch points go over anything from communication down to, you know, well-being that way, Jason. So, and we really help organizations not only understand, hey, this is the Kobe result. How do you make it actionable across your business so you really see that impact of that impact in the investment in people, but also the investment in the theory and the tool. Thank you for sharing that, Sean. And for those who are watching, humanworks8.com um, is where you can go. And those listening, that's humanworks and then the number eight.com. And you can go and what Sean just described, you can actually see their 12 touch points and how they embed this, this conative aspect of the mind into those 12 touch points in the employee life cycle. So for you business leaders, HR leaders that are thinking, Oh, this is just fluffy stuff. No, it's not. It is. They have a, a, there's a platform, there's a framework for how this has been injected into the employee life cycle to deliver value inside organizations. And Sean, that segues us right into our lightning round. I can't believe we're already uh -oh. here, but uh, the lightning round, you're not going to be struck by lightning unless it's a great epiphany that you have for your answers on these. But we're just going to ask you <laughs> a few questions here to let everyone get to know you a little bit better on a personal level. Are you ready? Fantastic. I'm ready. Let's go. Okay, here we go. First one. If you could choose any superpower in the world, what would you choose? Um, I would choose a being invisible. Uh, could you explain on that a little bit? Why invisible? Oh, I would, uh, you know, I am a listener. I like to watch, you know, people sometimes think, Sean, you're always, always out there. You know, I'm rather, you know, introverted, Ira, as far as I like to sort of just watch and listen and just being around and being able to observe people in action and things happening. I just, that, without being aware, I like invis. I, I want to be invisible. There you I go. like it, and that's really interesting when juxtaposed with a theater background because I wouldn't typically think of invisible with being on the stage in front of everyone. 
Well, but see, I'm a director type, so I'm more backstage than front stage, Jason. If you know me, I'm a backstage kind of person. Um, I want. I, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be about me. I just want the impact to be out there on the front stage. I, there you go. I dig it. So, so we got to ask someone with a background in theater. What is a favorite production or musical of yours? Wow. Um, so many things come to mind. You know, I'm a you know a Stephen Sondheim fanatic. So there, if you know a little bit about musical theater, that's definitely um, a part of me. Done a lot of work of his work. It's hard to pick one um, musical that is is a favorite, but um, I would say Sunday in the Park with George is uh, one of my favorite musicals. Nice, and Ira, I think that's the first time we've asked that question to actually. It is, and, and uh, you know, it comes up. But by the way, Sean, you would have loved it. I was, uh, we, we were in Broadway on Friday and Saturday, you... and saw the Neil. We saw the Neil Diamond play, oh, uh, yeah. which Beautiful was outstanding. With outstanding, and then we saw a uh, the play that goes wrong. Oh, that's a very uh, funny comedy. Hilarious! Oh, it's hilarious. Yeah. So. yeah. And Sean, last question. I'm jealous. So, so earlier I talked about how high school Jason would be very surprised at what adult Jason now is doing for a job in terms of entrepreneurship and being okay with figuring things out on the go. If you could go back to high school and what would your high school person or your friends or yourself be surprised to see about Sean Goyas now? Well, I, I don't think I would have ever thought I would have started a business. So that's that, that was never in my mindset. You know, I always like to laugh back in high school. I thought maybe I wanted to be a dentist or I wanted to be a teacher. Now, teacher, I can sort of see that would be a thing. I, you know, I, I don't know how this dentist, I think I just liked my dentist a lot. So um, I don't know if I, you know, what I like, what I kind of think that high school person would have said, you know, are you going to bring your theater? Is that going to stay with you in life? And it never has left me, both my love it, love of it, but also my use of what I learned working and putting together that big picture, helping organizations look at their big picture culturally and looking at a production's big picture. So those ties to theater, I think it would have been fun for my um, high school person to know, hey, keep doing that, Sean. It's going to come in useful as you continue in life. I love that. And when you mentioned dentists, obviously Ira and I perked up because Ira used to be a dentist. And that ties into his TED Talk that he gave in terms of when he talks about in his TED Talk how he decided that he was going to become a dentist. So you got to share that real quick, Ira, and how that, how that ties in. I definitely should have been exposed to the cold. <laughs> <laughs> Very opposite than you. Uh, I said I was going to be a dentist and thought I would always go into business. And, and one was really the same. I just didn't like what the product and the service that I was delivering. That wasn't the passionate part, building the business, working with the people, building the teams, learning about the people, helping people overcome their fears. That was my, that was my passion. Unfortunately, when, when you're good at it, and, and, I believe, and hopefully I was, you have a lot of people that want your service and then you have to deliver it. So it would be you, you producing, a, you directing, producing a play, but then also being the primary actor in it every day. And That's tough. that doesn't sound like that would <laughs> be your lifelong you know, passion to be able to be on front of the crowd. So I switched, you know, 28 years ago. Fantastic. Well, Ira, a lot of things, dentist connection, a little theater that you like to, there we go. A lot of parallels. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, the one th and the one thing, and I don't want to overlook this, and then we, we got to close up uh, shop here, uh, is the fact of storytelling. And that's how you started. You, you know, that's how you got into this. And, and oh, at least you and I, Sean, and, and to some degree, Jason, can roll the clock back. And if you said we were going to, what were you going to do when you grow up? And you're going to be a storyteller. You were going to be an actor. You were going to be in theater. People say, what do you, you need a real job. Exactly. And, and to think that today is that storytelling is one of the most in-demand skills for every organization, for every role of, of even, even pitching yourself, even from individual careers, of telling your own story uh, in a better way to differentiate yourself from other people. So it, it's incredible the tie-ins and how all this works. And um, it's, it's been a pleasure having you today. Thank you. Well, thank you both for having me on. That that time went very, very quickly. I, like I said, I think I told Jason, if I get talking about something you're passionate about, the time just zooms. Talk about being in the zone. Thanks for allowing me to 
join you both here this afternoon. Absolutely. And as we let you go, Sean, just to let everyone know again, you can learn about his company and his team, uh, HumanWorks8 at HumanWorks8.com. The eight is the actual number. And then Sean, uh, the best way to get in touch with you, can people connect with you on LinkedIn? Oh, please do. Uh, if somebody does connect with me and you've mentioned that you saw me here, I will respond. So um, do reach out and say hi or send send a thought, a highlight or a challenge. I like that. And thank you both for your questions. I love those challenges. And the one thing that we can't ignore, Jason, is that beginning in January uh, or early February, uh, HumanWorks and Sean will be one of our new thought partners of GG Unleashed. So we've had, we, we're launching uh, the first episodes uh, this month. And with, and again, we, we have, we'll have uh, five or six thought partners uh, by the beginning of the year. And we're looking forward to having you, Sean. So you'll be able to learn a little bit more every month uh, from Sean. Thanks for unleashing me. I appreciate that. <laughs> Co-nation. Absolutely. Thanks, Sean. We'll see you again soon. All right. You both take care. Ira, that was absolutely fascinating talking about that part of the brain, because I, I got to admit, as a psychologist, I didn't get into conation a whole lot in the work that I've done. It was primarily the behavioral, cognitive, affective aspects of pulling together behavior plans, mm -hmm. trying to get people to work. So there was a lot of interesting nuggets for me today in terms of understanding instinctually how people are. What were some of your big takeaways today? Well, that would be one of them. Um, absolutely. I, I'm familiar with Colby. I was introduced that uh, years ago. Uh, you know, uh, organizations have asked uh, for it, but like you, my business was built around basically knowledge, skills, abilities, uh, a lot of the effective personalities, uh, cognitive skill, cognitive testing. You know, then we had the business, we had the business motivators, we had the why, we had the, the adaptability quotient, emotional intelligence. So that was sort of the niche. And it was like, oh, there's, there, there's, there's but there's always one thing missing. And uh, th it was a very powerful, uh, enlightening conversation today. And uh, so I was connecting the dots of how utilizing the, co the cognitive uh, model would fit and enhance many of the other models that we had. And as Sean said, none of them are standalones. We're not, we're human beings. So we're not that easy to figure out. That's right. Absolutely. And we're all unique in very different ways. Well, Googleization H1, want to thank you for tuning in today. Um, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do so on your favorite podcast platform. Also leave us a rating and review. Um, because of you, we're in the top 1% of all podcasts in the entire world. That's There's 3 million podcasts in the world. You've got us in the top 1%. Um, so obviously you love the guests, the content, and everything that's coming out. So thank you for your loyal support. We're also inside the top 100 for business management and also for thought leadership as well. So thank you for helping us on that journey. And we're excited to be unleashing um, as Ira mentioned, many thought leaders heading into 2023 in shortened, con uh, condensed episodes that are 15 minutes long called GGG Unleashed. And Sean and Human Works 8 team is going to be one of those thought partners. So you can look forward to more engaging content from him in the new year. But until next time, I'm Jason Cochran signing off. And I'm Ira Wolf. Special thanks to Y Institute for partnering with us and sponsoring this episode. Thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. And until next week, don't let the shift hit your plans.